Welcome to Romero Records Virtual Cast. Today we have on the Briar Moritz. How's it going, man? It's going good. How's everybody doing? Man, it's been so while. I mean, it's been so while. It's, it's been such a long time. It's been a while. <laughs> I'll say it definitely has. It definitely has. So you're in Japan now. The um, reason why this man is in Japan is because he's in the Air Force. Uh, he is serving our country and and giving giving everybody the uh, the best service that he can do because he is an outstanding <laughs> airman. <laughs> this man gaslighting so hard. Oh man! So me and Briar, we um, we had a lot of fun in our. Do we do we know each other in basic? I think. Uh, we were, oh, we were. Okay. What's his name? Um, we were in tech school together. I said, I don't know if it, I don't know if I ran, I think I might've run into it basic, but I don't know. Basic is a blur. We were in what's his name's, uh, group at the, uh, the airman's week. Oh yeah. 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 God, what did that dude's name? He was a tech. Oh. Well, airman's week. That's like, I don't know. That's tough. Cause it, it was airman's week. Cause that's where I think I first met you. Then yeah, it'd be end of the week, and then we went into tech school together. And obviously, we were in the same tech school class. Dang, I don't remember that dude's name, but yeah, that was when we first met. Um, so yeah, basically, uh, what was basic? Eight weeks. Eight yeah, weeks, eight and then weeks. air. So yeah, so we, yeah, Air Force basic training. You're in Lackland, Texas, and um, you go through basic training for eight weeks. Then the ninth week, I believe, was the Airman's Week. And then we went yeah, to tech school. Like yeah. Uh, so me and Briar were in tech school, uh, learning about bombers uh, in Wichita Falls, Texas. And uh, then I end up go. Oh man! So this this story, I tell people this all the time. So <laughs> this kid went to Drexel University, right? Yeah, just for a little bit. All right. So this kid goes to Drexel, <laughs> accumulates too much debt according to the Air Force. And he ends up getting Whiteman, Missouri, as his base. And then they're like, nope, you can't go. And <laughs> so I asked, uh, what was that news name? Mr. Baca? Bob. Yeah, Mr. Baca. I asked Mr. Baca, this guy who's like basically controlling where we go. I'm <laughs> like, hey, can I go to Whiteman instead of Minot, North Dakota, since that kid can't go? And he was like, no. And I was like, what? I was like, you just swap people. Just put me in his place. Mr. Mr. Baca is just an old man that's a savage. I would say he was, I, don't, I think he's still I think he's still there too, which is crazy. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, I think that man just turned into a robot at some point and they replaced him and nobody knows. <laughs> Oh man. So yeah, we had great times in tech school, uh, just clowning around, just having fun. Um, so as, as I said, uh, you end up going to Barksdale, Louisiana and, yes, sir. uh, who else, who else went down there with you? So we, I went to, I went to Barksdale with boys from our class, technically Williams, even though he's a reservist and yeah. then, uh, uh, Turner. Oh, mail, yeah, turner right. for, mail turner for us because i know we had that as a class we referenced them differently so what happened to him again mail turner so he, he ended up getting out it was uh yeah he, he ended up separating early for other reasons nothing like crazy or anything it was just more of like a personal decision he yeah ended up separating early but i mean as a class we kind of knew that was going to end up coming eventually yeah, and then. But I say, I think he's doing. I think he's doing good for himself. I haven't talked to him in a while, but I think the last time I talked to him, I think he's doing well for himself. He's got this crazy, like, massive beard going on. What? Yeah, man, looks like a lumberjack, and it like threw me off because I was just like, when I see Turner's face, that's not the face I see. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's like a full on like trucker beard going on. That's crazy. Uh, I just realized yeah. I have a text to send right quick. Uh, one, <laughs> one of my friends, uh, he was asking me about um, a podcast uh, that's, that he's after you. And I forgot to tell him, yeah, we're still on. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I just, I just texted him and told him, yeah. But uh, <laughs> so um, 
so yeah, uh, Boyce ends up getting kicked out for that whole crazy situation. Yeah, that was, that's that weird. Yeah, to this day, that's still like, yeah, that's one of those things that's just uh, a little interesting to say the least to this day. Yeah. Also, so, I won't go into too much on that, but. Yeah, so I guess it's you. I don't even know if is female Turner still in. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting because like, out of our original, hold up, how many of us was it? Keith, Vega, Bipper, you, female Turner, male Turner, boys, and then technically Williams is a reservist, and then myself. Yeah. So it's seven of us or eight of us. Yeah. Yeah. So the class of eight, and if you well, and since he's a reservist, he's never going to get out. <laughs> <laughs> There's also no other way to put that. So why would he? Uh, yeah, so he's technically still in, but it's uh, female Turner, uh, Bipper, and myself that are still in. Bipper's in Tokyo, and then oh. uh, female Turner and myself are both down here in Okinawa. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we all ended up in pack ass, which I think is hilarious because we all started on bombers and then all of us left. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what happens. And, and my not, you get on that Korea train and then you get to go wherever you want to basically after that. Yeah, Bipper got lucky. He just bounced straight out of Whiteman straight to Yakota. I don't know. <laughs> that man's lucky. That but, dude, he's riding the life right now, going from Missouri. Oh, 100%. 100%. Uh, I see him post up on his Snapchat and everything about him in Tokyo and like just going to random places and stuff. And I'm just like, that's nice because Tokyo is yeah. massive. A lot of people really underestimate how big that city is because whenever they compare it to something in the States, they're going to compare it to something like maybe like San Francisco, Dallas, Houston, or like New York. And I'm pretty sure Tokyo can consume all of those cities. Mm. Like it is extremely large and people... Like, it's an awesome city to go around and stuff, but it's a lot bigger than a lot of people think. And then I've heard it's just, like, way more popu like, population density is, like, way more than, like, most, you know, most big cities that we have. Yeah, 100%. It's, oh, man, Japan is interesting. Like, coming over here from, like, a Western mindset, to like, the way we build houses, like, apartments and stuff, like, their apartments are tiny. Like, mm -hmm. like pretty tiny in my opinion. Like, I guess they're bigger than some stuff in the States, but like they're pretty tiny. Cause like my apartment here is just over 700 square feet. Okay. And my wife, like my wife, when she gets out here, her and I'll be here together. Okay. So it's like, it's not a massive space, but like, and this is, this is for Okinawa. Like when you get into Tokyo, like a lot of it's really packed together and like stacked on top of one another, mm -hmm. but it's an awesome city. I highly recommend everybody go just for the experience. Do you um? Do you only stay there for what is it like a year or two years, or are you there for like a long time? Oh, well, I'm here for a, a little while. So I'm here for right now. It's about it's three years, and then once the wife gets here, I'll have to. I'm pretty sure I'm gonna have to put a year onto the end of my tour length. It's like a mm -hmm. part of the program as far as like bringing the spouse over because she's military too. Yeah. So doing the mill to mill, it's a part of the program that basically once. So once she gets here, I'll have to add a year on. But it makes sense because it'll basically bump her and I's like time to leave here together. Um, it'll make it the same month. Okay. But yeah, I'll be here for four years. Um, is that is that a good thing? Do you want to be there for a while? Uh yeah, like I enjoy Japan. Like like I said, Japan's Japan's really nice. It's really pretty. It's easy to travel. I don't, I'm not concerned about traveling anywhere in this country. And I know no Japanese. Really? Like I can get around the country with no Japanese. Like safety is like almost no concern. Wow. Yeah. Like me coming back to the U.S. It was a weird culture shock because I was in Misawa before this for two years. So I've already been in Japan for two years prior to coming here. And when I went back to the States for leave, it was a bit of a culture shock because like, I don't know. It's just one of those things Like immediately I was like, I don't know. I don't feel safe going through like, <laughs> and I was, just, but I had no reason. I had no reason besides just like, like, I don't know. It's just one of those weird things because Japan, it's like a lot of people like immediately, as soon as they see me, especially since I'm around a military base, they're like American military. 
Mm. So some people won't necessarily, it's not like a, how do I put it? It's not like a prejudice thing or anything, but they just like, they usually just keep their distance from you sometimes, but mm. they won't necessarily interact with you and they, they keep it super professional and stuff. So it's like, I'm not too concerned. Like people don't lock their cars out here. Wow. Yeah. Like it's a thing. That's crazy. It's a thing. Cause I can't tell you how many times I've like, I've walked out the commissary, walked up to a car that looked like mine, opened the door and I look inside and I'm like, this is in my car. <laughs> like, I cannot tell you, like I literally, and I start freaking out. Like, oh, I'm going to get in trouble because someone's thinking I'm stealing their car. Yeah. But people, people just don't lock their cars. Some people don't lock their houses either. Cause it's just like a, it's not a thing. That's like their crime rates are super. No, it's a, it's a major culture shock. So like I could, like I hear there's oh sorry go ahead. You, you said you have a car. Um, yes. Did you just buy it there and like how how's that process work? Uh so yeah because uh yeah I mean it's pretty straightforward. So a lot of times the like, cars get passed down to the military because if it's from a Japanese because you can buy from like dealerships and stuff. There's a little bit more paperwork involved, but it's pretty comparable to what happens in the U.S. It's like the same process of like title registration, getting your name on the title. The only, and then like you have to have insurance and stuff. Uh, they take that real serious out here. Like you don't have insurance, like, and you get caught without it, you're not going to drive. Mm. Like they'll, they'll revoke your driving privilege for a year. Dang. Even if you live off base, they'll be like, find your way on base. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just, a, it's a part of the, like, it's a part of the process. Cause it's, it's definitely seen as a privilege here more so than a lot of other places in the world, but it's definitely seen as a privilege. Man. But yeah, the only thing you have to do is like this Japanese compulsory inspection, JCI. It's every two years and it's basically like an inspection to say that your car is like safe for the road. Hmm. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, do you do you enjoy like driving on the roads better there? Is it I mean, is it a big difference? Uh I wouldn't say how do I put it? It is different. You drive on the opposite side. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm gonna tell you right now when I was cool. There's a fun story that I'll get to that. But uh <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah, no, it's pretty it's pretty much the same. Uh their speeds are a lot slower. Hmm. So like here in Okinawa, I think the fastest unless I'm on the highway, like the fastest public road I think is like maybe sixty kilometers an hour, which is like forty ish miles an hour. Oh wow. Yeah, so like their speeds are really slow. But um outside that, like I mean, it's not too bad. It's like it, it was an easier adjustment than I thought it would be, to put it that way. Okay. Hmm. Now, yeah, the fun that are funny you, story. Are you driving on um like is it like right hand drive or are you Yeah, right hand like, drive. But you're still on the right side of the road or no on the left side of the road. So you're driving on the left side of the road, right hand drive. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Well, do I have it right? I'm trying to think. Yeah, yeah. Left hand. Yeah, you're on the right hand side of the car, and then you drive on the left hand side of the road. Yeah, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Their turn signals, their uh, turning lanes here are no joke, though. They they'll throw you off because in the states, usually the turning lane is the first lane to go, and then the main flow of traffic goes. It's the mm -hmm. opposite here. So the main flow of traffic will go, and then the light will go, yellow, red, green turn signal, and then the turning lanes will go. Hmm. Yeah. So it's it, that like threw me off at first because I thought like, yeah, it's just bad. And then people like to jump the red lights. Oh my like, god. Yeah. They, they there's like a rule they call like the red light plus three, because usually people because the lights are so quick that people will try to make that light. So there'll be like an additional three cars that come through. So you kind of have to like give it some time for it. That is hilarious. But no, like I said, the funny story is when I went back to the States, because uh, I flew into Birmingham. I say, I know where you know that. Oh, I flew yeah. into Birmingham and uh, I met the wife there because that was like where I could get like my my uh the military covered my plane ticket that was the closest place i could get to her she was in florida mm. so we went from birmingham and then drove up to pennsylvania which is about like a 14 hour drive Dang. yeah i jumped right into it right and it's not like i haven't driven in the states like but 
it probably wasn't the wisest decision because it was driving at night and stuff. Mm. But let me tell you, there was a moment, and it was pretty low traffic, so it wasn't anything crazy, but like, and then the highway, just get on the highway and just go. But when we got off the highway, my brain just kicked into like autopilot and I started driving on the left-hand side and the wife immediately is just like, what are you doing? And I was like, what are you talking about? And she goes, you're on the wrong side. And I was like, okay. Oh, like, okay. My God. Yeah. So I got a, I got an earful for that, but, uh, <laughs> 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 well, cause I, my brain just immediately just went into autopilot. Like it just didn't, it felt normal and stuff. And I was like, oh man, this is going to be, if, if the cop sees us do this, he's going to be like, what are you doing? And then I'm going to have to go through this whole ex- explanation. And he's just going to look at me and be like, sure, dude. And I'm like, I'm telling you, like, this is exactly what happened. You don't understand. I'm, I live in Japan. What are you talking about? Uh, I'm in the Air Force. Uh, low yeah, ball. What you're saying. crazy. And you know, you know, you're driving through, like, some, some of the states, the cops are just going to be like, sure, dude. Like, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but. That's pretty yeah, that was a, I'll say that was an interesting situation, to say the least. <laughs> so, um. Yeah, so I'm guessing you you went back to see the folks back in Pennsylvania. Yeah, I'll say with COVID and everything that was going on and stuff, like I've been like between like trying to see like the family and stuff, um, and with the obviously see the wife and everything because her and I got married during COVID, mm. and obviously we've been separated. Like her and I have been separated since Korea, so it's been two two years, going on three years. Dang. Yeah. And so we got married uh, last October and stuff, but we just did it over, uh, I wouldn't say it's mail-in or anything like that, but we just basically did it over the internet. It was like the best way to approach that, just so that the military can recognize it, I'll say, because uh, otherwise they just like, if I'm not married to her and stuff, they're just like, you're just two separate people. Like they don't, <laughs> yeah, they just, there's nothing to it. So, so yeah, we went back to Pennsylvania to do a reception for like the folks and stuff because her and I are planning obviously once this COVID stuff blows over and everything to have like a small wedding in Hawaii and stuff. Mm, nice. Yeah, just just with the immediate family and everything. Okay. That's yeah. Um, what, what where is she, I'm sorry, where is she from? She's from Hawaii. Oh, she's from Hawaii? Yeah. Nice, nice. Um, yeah. And how did y'all meet? Uh, in Korea. Oh, oh okay. man, that's scary. <laughs> Yeah, this, is, uh, this no. is the time to tell it <laughs> <laughs> so like voice drove up to the little reception in pennsylvania all the way from louisiana so that was i thought that was super or he flew in but he actually like came to pennsylvania and stuff and then uh it's just funny because he uh we we're going through we did, we did a little pop quiz and it was just like, oh, like, who was the first person to say I love you? And everybody was, thought it was her. And I was like, nope. <laughs> that's not me. And man, boys, he stood up immediately and was just like, what? <laughs> like, he didn't believe it. And I was just like, oh, here we go. So I ha- always have to explain this story. So, like, um, <laughs> so he gets, I get to Korea and stuff. And uh, come into the shop and everything. And I'm not, I'm just trying to do my own thing, not really like paying attention to too many people. Just doing my own thing and stuff, get settled, get to like get comfortable. And um, after a little bit, um, started to talk to more people. I'm a real social person. And then uh, I'm going home one night and then my phone starts ringing. And I'm like, okay, like, what, like who is this? So I pick up. And uh, I just hear this voice that says, like, hi, uh, this is Maureen. Like, oh, we work together in the same shop. Uh, I just was wondering, like, I know you're new. Like, do you want to come out to, like, Saku Saku, which is like a like a chicken wing spot, basically, in Korea? And I was just like, uh, sure. Like, I was like, I'm not going to say no. But I was like, it's a very weird thing to happen. Have, like, a female, you know, call me up on the phone, ask me, I want to go get chicken. But I was like, I'm not going to say no. <laughs> So as soon as I get off the phone with her, I call up Ford. I don't know if you remember him. He was in the class behind us, but we were I in do. Korea together. I do. So I call up Ford and I explain the situation to him. And he's just like, are you going? And I was like, uh, yeah. I was like, I'm just confused as to what's going on. So 
I go out to this chicken joint with her and stuff and her friends and end up drinking too much soju that night. That was, a, that's another story. That was rough. <laughs> but I'll, uh, I say I enjoyed that night and stuff and her and I like really hit it off and everything. But then after that, her and I started, you know, hanging out more, talking more. And the one day, I don't know why, but one day I was just on the phone with her. Like she went up to her room because she was in the building across the street from me and I was going up to mine. And we were getting off the phone and it was just like normal stuff. And as soon as like, all right, I'll talk to you later. And it's like, all right, love you. Bye. And I was like, and she panicked. <laughs> she panicked. She panicked and hung up. And then I'm sitting there like, uh, I don't know why I just said that. Like that just came out. Like I just, like there was no like my brain didn't think twice about it. It just came straight out with it. And I was just like, well, that, I said that. I was like, that cat's out of that bag, okay? So. Uh, oh, man. So what happens next? So, like, ob- so obviously after that, like, at this point, like, her and I basically start steady dating. And then, um, because when it comes with military stuff, like, when you're about the PCS and everything, so we obviously enjoy the rest of our time in Korea, hanging out. At one point, she basically ends up moving into my dorm room and stuff. And we just end up like, you know, just hanging out and stuff. Like we both lived out of that room and everything. So it was super, super nice. And like Korea for me was probably one of my favorite times so far since I've been in. Because mm. it was just a year of work hard, play hard. Obviously met the wife there and stuff. Uh, went and did a bunch of stuff around Korea with her. And uh, but the biggest thing was like when it comes time to leave, what are we going to do? Mm. Because... On paper, I can tell you right now, I could say I could do long distance all day. In reality, that stuff is a lot harder than anybody will ever tell you. Yeah. That, that stuff is rough. So when it comes time to leave, she's going to Florida and I'm going to Misawa, Japan. So it's like, like what, what like her and I had a conversation, like, what are we going to do with this? And we both said, like, wh- why not give it a shot? Because it's like, I, I couldn't, like... I couldn't see not being with her at that point. Mm-hmm. And it sounds crazy to say because I, I really had came into Korea with no, none of those intentions. Yeah. But leaving, I was just like, yeah, I can't see my life without this girl. Yeah. So um, her and I decided to, like, you know, make the make the long distance work and stuff. And obviously, we've had our ups and downs. Like, I'm not going to sit here and sugarcoat it. That stuff is tough. Oh, yeah. Um, and then obviously COVID didn't help because it basically postponed any travel out of Japan because Japan got real strict with it. Like people think the U.S. got strict with it, but Japan was like, did not care. No in or out unless it was on official government orders. Ooh. Yeah. Like I, I was in basically full lockdown and stuff. And like I was still working, mind you. I wasn't in like the 14 days of like, you know, everybody sit at home. Like, no, it was you're not allowed to go here. You're not allowed to go here. You can't leave the country. You can't go here. You can't do this. So like they started like putting all the restrictions down and then, um, but I still had to go to work and stuff and, you know, do my, do my duties for my country, you know? Um, but, uh, yeah, so there was that, but like I said, long distance, that whole thing put the clamps on. Then obviously fast forward, we got, did the whole um, marriage thing. Finally got joint spouse approval. I say she is a weapons troop mm. uh, as well, but she's now she's moved over to Chaplin's assistant and stuff. Oh, and she right. yeah, she should be out here in about two months tops. Okay. Yeah, so I'm excited because I'll finally like her and I will finally be under the same roof and in the same time zone for once. That's so crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so when you when you go into this relationship knowing that you know eventually this is going to be that's going to be the situation yeah uh, did you feel did you feel pressured to to have that kind of do you feel like your feelings got accelerated like <laughs> cuz you you know you know it's going to happen so do you just kind of like push them push them forward see man this is a fun conversation. So, because for me, me and my emotions and stuff, I'm not necessarily the most well in tune with them. Mm-hmm. But it was just one of those things. It's like I just had to sit down and have like a real like logical conversation with myself and just be like, 
it was I wouldn't necessarily say pressure, but I just sat there and thought like I can't like I can't do this without her essentially is what I started thinking. And mm-hmm. it's like as soon as I started having thoughts like that, it's just like that's telling me that this is not just like another person to me. Like this is somebody special. If I'm already thinking like I can't see myself not going through life without this person. Yeah. And that's when I started to really start thinking the whole um like okay, like I want to like make this serious and stuff. I'll say the the military as a whole um, did put some like pressure, obviously, because I like there's certain things like obviously I did, nobody wants to try and get like married over the internet or anything like that. Uh, like I would have rather tried to do something a little more formal and stuff and everything, but it's all it is is legal, and we're still planning on doing the ceremony and everything later. But like that that side of things, there was some uh, pressure just so it's like to get it legal on paper to start the process and everything because there's a lot of like um, little details and regulations and stuff that don't, you kind of have to like look through to, to make sure like you both do it right. Because if I would have applied earlier, like last year, then she wouldn't have been able to cross train. Mm. Yeah. So like there's certain, cause they prioritize trying to put the couples together. Like that's the whole, that's, that's their priority. So they try to basically move mountains and they'll like cancel training and all this other stuff to make it happen. Dang. Okay. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a really, really involved process. Lots of like asking people the right questions, trying to figure out what questions to ask, looking through a lot of the regulations yourself and everything like, yeah. So it's, a, it's very involved, but. Yeah. I mean like, so when I'm in North Dakota, um, uh, and I get there October, 2015, you know, I, mm-hmm. I dated a couple girls. Um, and then I met Rachel in August of 2016 mm-hmm. and, um, just met her like one night out with some friends. And then we started talking then started dating or whatever. And like, I kind of had to make a decision of like, you know, cause I joined the military to experience life. Like I'm trying to go places, you know, experience different chicks and all kinds of stuff. Like I'm trying to, you know, live it up. But, <laughs> but, um, you know, when, when I met her, I'm like, Oh, she's like everything I've wanted yeah. <laughs> and one chick. So I had to make the decision of, do I want to keep this young mindset of, you know, living life and doing all, you know, doing everything that I want to do, or do I want to not, live without her you know like yeah do do i feel like i had at the end of the day i had to make decision like would i rather you know do my the plan that i had or would i rather be with her and know that i have her and yeah i was like yeah i would regret not sticking with her 100 percent. i got yeah i know what you mean there like 100 percent and th- and that you know that was really my decision on like full fledged you know being in a relationship and getting married because as I said we met in August of sixteen we got married in January of seventeen so yeah okay. that was like you know when I made the decision that that's who I wanted to be with you know mm-hmm. it was like yeah I'm I'm just gonna marry her because you know that's it's there's there's just two lifestyles you know if if you decide to use the lifestyle of being with her then might as well get married. Like, <laughs> what are you putting this all for? <laughs> yeah. I'll say that's, that's exactly like, it, there's, no, there's no better way to put it and stuff. Cause like, I didn't know, I didn't like, I couldn't sit down and like pinpoint anything. It was just kind of like, this is it. Like, I don't know what it is, but this is it. Yeah. It's just like, like everything, like the way she talks, the way she walks, like her, like, outlook on life mentality her whole attitude and everything was just like yeah like this is it like there's there's like there's no question like questions like about it as far as like oh do I really want this or anything it's like no like I can't I can't let this one go if that makes sense yes yeah I know exactly how you feel and and like when when I like made that decision it made me like question everybody who's ever had a really long engagement (laughs) (laughs) Listen, I did, I did the same thing, and I started like, am I like, do I think I'm better than people? Like, am I really better than people right now? I was like, I was like, why? Like, 
I don't know why it does it, but it does. Like it's a, it's a, it makes you start to look at people like, no, you gotta find somebody like this, and you're, they're like, sure, and you're like, no, like seriously, you gotta like, <laughs> I'm telling you, this will change your life. Yeah, I mean, when you find somebody who's like that perfect, you're like, why, why, why is engagement such a long process? Which you know, some people plan like huge weddings and all that kind of stuff, so they need a long engagement because they have to. Like, you know, you're, you're still engaged until you've had the ceremony. So, yeah. uh, or, you know, until you sign the paper. So whatever engagement link might be based off of your, uh, your wedding plans, but Mm -hmm. there are people who are engaged for like years just because they don't know, you know, there's, they're still debating and yeah, that's, yeah, that's just crazy to me. Cause it's like, I'm not all for like though like shotgun weddings and stuff like that but it's just like i feel like it's one of those things like if you know like you truly know then it's like go for it if that's how you feel yeah and and in the military it makes an even bigger difference because that's that's money you're putting off on <laughs> and then also the convenience like as you said now that you're married the military's like all right cool let's put y'all together but if you never yeah, made that decision y'all still be apart correct because the military at that point if her and I wanted to be together, we'd both have to really like play into the listing and playing to orders together and stuff, which is like, it's like, uh, how do I put it? Like gambling, but you have a little bit of say, but not much. Yeah. So it's just like, but now that her and I are married and stuff, the military recognizes both of us as a, a single unit. Like yeah. we're separated, but they're like, you two like prioritize and putting together unless her and I elect to not be put together. But that's crazy. Some people do it, but to me, that's crazy. So what are your, um, I guess your, your current plans? Like you're going to stick with, stick with your career field. So, yeah. So currently, um, uh, cause once I finish out Okinawa here, I'll be at my halfway mark as far as like a standard 20 year careers looked at. Mm-hmm. So I'll hit my, uh, 10 year mark. And at that point, like I have yet to reenlist and stuff. I've just extended my contract. So at that point, that's when it's like a real debate comes down as far as like, do I want to stay in and do 20? Um, like you said, do I want to stay in this career field and stuff? So it, t- it turns into a lot of uh, um, like big life-changing questions. Because if I'd elect to not stay in, then I'm going to have to hop out, go into the civilian sector and like, I wouldn't say start fresh, but like obviously working in the military is way different than working in the civilian sector. Like they're just two different animals. Yeah. Um, yeah, currently, um, I say I have no problems with the, the weapons career field. I was like, it is, it is a lot different than most people think. I mean, the military as a whole is a lot different, uh, is very different compared to what most people's perceptions of it are. But, um, I'm looking to cross train. Um, I have a few things in mind, but nothing I'm like fully in love with and stuff. I want to try and shadow it or do a little more like research on it and stuff. Because uh, the maintenance career field, like, you know, work, like, hands-on and being fully engaged like that and stuff is something, like, I've truly, like, I do enjoy it. And uh, um, I feel pretty qualified as a weapons troop, mm-hmm. working four different airframes in my short time in. Like, I feel pretty, I won't say well-rounded, but, like, I understand, like, a lot of the weapons platforms and understand, like, what it takes to work on the jets and what the jets need as far as like maintaining and fixing issues that come up with them. What aircraft did you work on? Uh, B-52, uh, A-10, F-16, and now the F-15. What was your favorite? Oh, the A-10, hands down. Why, why would you say the A-10? Uh, it's just a really simple aircraft to wrap your head around. Hmm. So a lot of these other ones are complex wiring and like craziness and stuff, but the A-10 is just a very like, I look at the A-10 like an old farm truck. It's nothing sporty. It's nothing exotic. But, like, if you want it to work, you can beat on it with a wrench. It's real simple. Like, just, it's just, oh, it's just very intuitive. Like, it doesn't take a lot for you to try and, like, understand it's, like, crazy complex systems. It's just very straightforward. Like, without, I can't, I don't know how much I can say, but, like, for the most part, like, it just, very mechanical and just straight to the point like there's not really looking up some crazy like schematics and trying to figure out like 
basically try to re-engineer the aircraft and you don't have to do that you just turn wrenches on it and it's just straight to the point like it's well thought out to put it to say the least mm. like the engineers that built it really kind of thought the airframe out and like made everything make sense i can't say the same for the rest of them because i'm gonna <laughs> tell you right now sometimes like some of the things that they designed were never meant to be messed with for the most part but these jets are being flying I mean, the 52 is flying well past its service life. At this rate, it might be a 100-year bomber, which is kind of crazy. Absolutely. I mean, I believe the current plan was for Northrop Grumman to uh, put the B-21 in place by 2040, I think. Yeah, but I'm telling you right now, I don't it, I don't think it'll replace the B-52. I just don't. I don't know what it is, but it's just like it seems like they're just going to continue to fly that thing. That's so crazy. And for those of you who don't know, the B-52, I think it was made in like the 40s or 50s or something. No, the, was so it the 60s? It was, uh, yeah. So I think most of the ones that are flying now are the 60s, but it was like late 50s, early 60s. That's that's just mind-blowing. Like most people, yeah. like, you know, it, we're, you got people who were 18 years old all the way till their 30-something taking care of this aircraft. And <laughs> they have no experience before <laughs> they're just, you know, learning and learning on the job and their knowledge is only as far as what a book told them or somebody else told them beforehand. And they're mm -hmm. keeping this 60 year old aircraft in the air. Most yep. people can't keep their car running for <laughs> for 10 years <laughs> if that's not the truth i don't know what is so the fact that this thing is still you know flying and we're trusting it is outstanding it's it's incredible yeah the the crazy thing that someone told me that like kind of like stood out to me is that there was some 18 year old in the 60s working on this jet and now there's 18 year olds in 2021 working on this jet. And I'm just like, so there's some man in his seventies that was doing the same thing I was doing. And there's a massive gap between us, but him and I have common ground just because we've worked on this aircraft and it's still flying 60 years later. Yeah. Like think of your granddad could have worked on the same aircraft yeah. <laughs> that you worked on. Yes. Like that's just like, it's just one of those just weird things to start wrapping your head around. And like, for those of you who don't know, like that the military just, they blow money on really dumb stuff. And then they also do their best to save money. I think in really dumb ways as well. <laughs> uh, yeah. So the department of defense spending is a, a fascinating thing to look at to say the least. Absolutely. I remember when somebody told me like the price of the Alcom grease for the B-52. <laughs> like, yeah. What? You start looking at like some of the costs of like just common parts and stuff. You just kind of like scratch your head. Like I'll, I'll never, I'll never forget. Um, so, you know, in, in North Dakota, it was like stupid windy. And oh, trust me. <laughs> this, this one time, um, our, um, who was it? our squadron commander? He's he's like, um, y'all keep leaving the doors open on the bread vans, and the doors keep flying off and breaking, and I'm sick and tired of paying five grand for doors. And I was like, yep. pause. You're paying five grand for a door? I was like, where are you oh, getting your doors God. from? Mercedes Benz? I was like, what's going on? Yeah, and it's on these old Chevy Metros that have seen like relatively they look new because when you look at the miles on them you're like oh it doesn't have that many miles and it's like <laughs> listen it's got like thousands of hours on here like tens of thousands of hours on this motor like, <laughs> i've heard a story i think in like ellsworth i think they like one of their fixes for that because they, they kept having people break the doors and stuff is they ended up just bolting uh two loops into the doors and then they put a ratchet strap between it so when you get when you open the door to get out, the ratchet strap will catch it if the wind was about to take it. Mm. But you have to kind of like shimmy out of that little space now. Wow. But that was like the that was like the cheap quick fix that they decided to stick with, I've heard. I think one thing they did for us, I can't remember. I think they were saying that they were going to either 
take the doors off or leave the doors like closed so you couldn't get out that like that other side and i was like all right one of those sounds awful like no door yeah. at all and then the other one sounds awful but doesn't sound safe at all yeah. <laughs> i don't know no no doors in north dakota that winter time yeah i don't know about that yeah i can't remember what they went with uh but yeah that was that was such a, a funny time just because he was talking about like uh, spending that much money on those doors. And I was like, why are you spending that much money on doors? Yeah, it's, it's one of those things that, like I said, just makes you like start to scratch your head. I know some of them, some of them are under a contract. So like, that's where like those costs start to get like derived from. And it's just one of those things, like it's really hard to like, because realistically, I'm like, that's like a $500 door to junkyard, if that. Exactly. Like, you can just walk, like, you can order it in from a junkyard. Over here, obviously, overseas, it's a whole different ball game. Like, because everything has to get nailed in, nailed in or flown in and stuff. Yeah. But, yeah. So, like, my mail takes like 15 days to get here, 15 Damn. to 20 days. Yeah. Shoot. And that's if there's no backlog. Like, right now, I think there's a backlog going on. So, it's like, it's coming in by like plane and boat and it like takes like quite a while, mm. but yeah. So what is something that you, I guess, you know, if, if you decide to get out, like what would you be looking forward to? Oh, I'd probably end up going back to school. So I would, like, I wouldn't say probably, I would for sure start going back to school and uh, taking care, like getting my, an engineering degree, probably a mechanical engineering degree. And um, I said, go back to school full time, mind you. Um, get my mechanical engineering degree or like something with business and finance and stuff. Maybe something in IT, maybe just like a, just some cert certifications or something in the background and everything. Cause it seems like everything's going like technology based and internet based, especially with the whole COVID thing. Like everything seems to be leaning that way, but I still want like a physical trade of some sort to fall back on. Because it's one of those things, like, the world's always going to need, like, doctors and engineers and all that kind of stuff. So it's just, like, I want something to fall back on. And I've always had a a passion for kind of, like, the engineering side of things. I was a gearhead, big gearhead and stuff, like, loving cars and everything like that. It's always been a side that I've always enjoyed. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah it would definitely be, it'd definitely be school. Did I, school did I tell you what I do? What's that? Did I tell you what I do? Uh, I'm not sure. I know not to sound creepy or anything, but I know I keep tabs on people and stuff. I try to keep engaged with people and stuff, especially for like you with your social media and everything. Like I do my best to try and keep tabs on everybody because the world's a crazy place and it's hard to keep up with everybody with everything that's going on. Yeah. So, um, I went to a program called the AAM program and, uh, mm -hmm. it was in Milwaukee. They have two locations right now. One's in, uh, some Heights, Ohio, and the other one's in uh, Milwaukee. But there's mm -hmm. a company called Rockwell, uh, Rockwell Automation. And what they do is they've got software, and they also uh, have, like, a partner company called Allen Bradley who makes all the hardware. But mm -hmm. they make stuff like uh, motors, drives, um, uh, like uh, relays, all kinds of stuff for, um, like, automation for, like, uh, manufacturing and it's really cool stuff as far as like programming wise um if you like you say you want to do mechanical engineering there are some people in this career field that are mechanical engineers but most of them are electrical engineers yeah but, um it, i mean it deals with it deals with programming uh it's with like ladder logic it's not so much like coding like you know people think of like somebody nerded up like coding and whatnot uh um, yeah ladder logic is pretty cool and simple um like the processes like once you make the code it just kind of like runs so um like whatever your um like manufacturing line is doing is just got a code that says all right when this thing opens do this and when that thing closes do that and then it's like you know the whole the whole process going down the line is just yeah. code and you just you can just read it like a book from left to right and then you go down and, um, that's, that's basically what I do is, uh, I wire up stuff. Um, I, you know, check coding and, and panel views and, and like the whole process, like 
that's that's my day to day, and I have to deal with like um, network switches and Cisco and all that kind of stuff, and it's pretty fun. Um, sometimes it can be really boring, just like having to make sure something works after like literally just stare at it and just, <laughs> and, just and you know hope it's working, but um, yeah. it it's definitely a thing of the future. So you know when you see like robots uh, doing you know just picking up stuff and putting it down like. I'm I'm in charge of that at my plant, just making sure a robot's doing what it's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, it's I definitely think it's something that you know, manufacturing wise, everything's going to go to that. Even outside of manufacturing, there's a guy who went to Cargill. They make like a uh, sausage and pepperoni and that kind of stuff. He worked mm -hmm. there in Nashville, but now he works in Amazon in Florida. But um, yeah, like if if you decide to go in that, just you know, let me know and I can definitely help you into that career field. But, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. And I think it's definitely a thing of the future. Yeah. It seems like I said, the, it seems like everything I've looked into and stuff like that's where everything's leaning is just automation just because it's a more straight, like it's a more, how do I say like formulaic way of like measuring things. Mm -hmm. like as far as like production times if you're looking at like plants and stuff like your production times are more consistent there's less room for human error and stuff because you're more like you just monitor the systems and everything and the robots can run 24 7 based, until a part physically breaks they'll basically just continue to run yeah so it seems like that's where everything is going so i know a lot of uh a lot of your big car manufacturers tesla with their gigafactory and uh that they're trying to put up in germany and stuff like that there's like a crazy process that they're using to i think it's like injection mold the shell of their cars which is like mm. it's this massive crazy machine that there's like only like a handful on the planet and tesla wants their hands on it and stuff because that process makes their like frame sturdier and like makes them faster has less like uh spare parts and everything but it's this massive like super technical machine but it basically runs itself you just have people there to monitor and make sure there's no defects but like it runs itself and tesla is obviously one of those big booming companies lately so that's pretty crazy um do, do you see yourself um doing any kind of training like or not training but like well yeah like teaching training like while you're in the military or do you want to just continue to basically like work like be a mr uh, oh so okay text. yeah that's, no I, I see what you're saying like it's a good question so like because right now like i'm a i'm a staff sergeant so it's e5 um so i am doing a lot of training and stuff for like the younger guys that are coming in coming in like who have like a little bit of military experience but they don't really know the full military and don't know like the aircraft and stuff like that because like i'm still getting spun up on this aircraft but there's a lot that like there's a lot of similarities that your brain doesn't necessarily have to try and relearn everything it's just like take your already previous knowledge and just tweak it a little um but uh yeah no i as corny as it sounds because i didn't like teaching like i was like i don't want to be a teacher i'd never want to be a teacher but i do like instructing people like giving that knowledge and stuff so I'd like to um, become like an FTD instructor where they teach like, you know, your maintenance jobs and like troubleshooting jobs and stuff like that. Or as like an evaluator again, I'd probably end up doing that, um, going to uh, the weapons load training facility and stuff and just like teaching like the new guys how to load and all that kind of stuff. But I could see it. Yeah, I have that... nothing against doing 20 years. I mean, it's, it's not the military is a very good gig. Like I live well. Like I'm not, I don't, I'm not struggling or anything like that. Like I'm living in Japan. Like it's, it's, I can't complain. Yeah. But, I mean, you have to think the alternative, you know, you'd have to be either in school or you're looking for something to do. Yeah. <laughs> and especially with this economy, like dear God. Yeah. That, that was like the one thing with the, the big COVID swing that kind of was like, it was interesting to see because a lot of people started to stay in a little more and I'm just like the military is like, it's not a bad gig because COVID or not, like they're still going to start, they're still going to pay you. You're still going to have some type of employment and stuff. Like, like just because of COVID, it does it didn't stop. It did change things. It did slow some things down, but like the military and department of defense is a machine that never sleeps. Yeah. 
Yeah. So um, when you when you do decide to go somewhere else, where where would you want to go? Like, where's your next base? Oh, that's a that. See, that's a the wife and I've been chatting it up. We're trying to figure it out because I would like to go to um, Europe. Hmm. Okay. Because it's because I've spent all this time in PACAF between Korea and Japan. Like I've spent um, over here in the Pacific Air Forces. So I'd like to go to Europe. Um, there's a lot of like beautiful places in Europe, like Greece, Italy, Germany. Like, and as long as you have a passport and stuff, obviously, I'm talking uh, post COVID. Um, you can travel around pretty easily with amongst Europe as long as you have a passport and stuff. Like, you can you can just not let's say a waltz into any country, but like, you can just go in, take a day trip to Italy, or go up take a day trip here and stuff. Like, because it's a lot smaller than the U.S., so it's super like. But that's definitely where it'd be. But if I were to go stateside, that's a tough one. Mm. That's a tough one. Because you know, you know how those the the bombers work and stuff. They're gonna want to bring me back, and I, I had my fill of it. It was a good time while while I was there for what it was. But I, I'm. I'm good. I don't want to go back there. I'd probably end up trying to go towards like um, maybe like Colorado, New Mexico, somewhere out towards the West Coast more so, I think. Mm. No, North Dakota is always open, man. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I don't know about that. That's cold. Hey, the best go north, man. <laughs> the best go north. <laughs> Why not? <Yeah>. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm good. Um, I'm way good. Oh my god! I'd, I'd go. I'd go to Minot before I went back to Barksdale, though. Dear just god. because, it, just <laughs> no, just because I know that's crazy. But that's just because I want something that's like I haven't been to Minot, so I think I could at least like try. This is on paper, mind you. Obviously, I didn't live up there like you did, but yeah. Uh, on paper, I just because it's like a different base. So I'll be working on an airframe that I've worked on, but it's a different base, so it doesn't feel the same. If that makes sense. Yeah. Well, it's been great talking to you, man. Um, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up, but um, we, we'll have to do this again and talk about other stuff than the military stuff. And... Oh, ab- absolutely. I'll say I'm always down for another time. <laughs> See, you, you said you didn't think we'd have anything to talk about, and one hour later, we're, oh. <laughs> we missed out on some stuff. Yeah, it's easy talking with you, though, honestly. I'll say it's good just catching up. Absolutely. Well, uh, thanks for everybody tuning in, and we'll see you next time.